My name is Sarge. I'm with the Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy as an AmeriCorps member. And today we are going to be going on a 14 mile hike through some of the most beautiful areas of the Appalachian Trail through the Rhone Highlands. Uh, along the way, we're going to stop through four major ecosystems. We're going to talk about the local wildlife and microclimates as we climb through the mountains. And we're also going to stop at segments so you too can hike this trail. You can do the whole 14 mile hike or we can chop it up into little five mile segments at checkpoints along the way. So let's get to it. The first leg of our hike is a 2000 foot climb from Hughes Gap to Cloudland. Here we'll slowly leave the northern hardwood forest and climb into high elevation spruce fir forest. You can hike just this section as an in and out by starting at Hughes Gap or you can start from Cloudland at its parking access. Right now we are hiking up through some northern hardwood forests. Coming up soon, we're going to run into some unique species found in this area. The pollen of arrow-leaved asters is loved by several species of bees. The leaves itself are visited with the tiniest crunches from caterpillars of butterflies and moths. While white coral fungus already takes on a striking appearance of coral, it is also an edible mushroom. Old man's beard is a lichen commonly found in forests that have excellent air quality. These can be used to create tinctures to help with inflammation. What you are actually looking at is the seeds of the pulpit. In the spring, these will plant and sprout to form a tube-like mouth, becoming a carnivorous plant. The hairy curtain crust can commonly be mistaken for turkey tail, but often grows abundantly on fallen tree logs. In the spring, a fruiting body of a hoof fungus can produce up to 887 million spores per hour. This fungus is also known as the Iceman fungus. Oatsy, a 5,000-year-old preserved Iceman that was found in a glacier on the border of Austria and Italy, carried three pieces of hoof fungus with him, thought to be for tinder use. Eastern newts produce a toxin called tetrodotoxin, which makes the species unpalatable to fish and crayfish. This biotoxin is shared with pufferfish, octopus, and shellfish species. This causes increasing paralysis of muscles in the body. Along our first section, if you hike from Hughes Gap, you will find a common plant here known as white snake root. Despite sharing a name with a famous band, it also has some historical references. Uh, historians believe that Abraham Lincoln's mother actually died indirectly from consuming white snake root. And this is because she drank milk from a cow that consumed the white snake root, which in turn poisoned her and led to her death. So don't eat it or don't graze your cows around white snake root. Another edible mushroom, mature puffballs release spores from a hole on top of their cap when agitated. Make sure to cut these puffballs from top to bottom to make sure it is pure white inside, like a marshmallow, with no developing caps or stems before consuming. Pink turtle head gets its name from its distinctive flowers, which look like turtle heads poking out from the stem. During this section of this hike, you'll also pass through another ecosystem, the northern hardwoods. This forest is characterized by yellow birch and beech trees, often growing so straight and close together that it can form an optical illusion known as parallax. This is when the image of an object is displaced when looking at it from different angles. You'll achieve this effect on the third segment of our trail on the descent to the Overmountain Crossroads. So I found one of these beech nuts here, which you can pop open, kind of like a pistachio. And if you squeeze on one of the sides of the shells, you can pop out one of these nuts. And so one nut on each. And these are edible to wildlife. They're nutrient packed for them in particular. And they are edible to humans. Um, when you do consume them though, they're a little bit astringent, meaning that they'll suck out the moisture from your mouth the longer you chew on it. So I wouldn't eat a ton of them, but it is kind of fun to try and, and see what happens. One very special thing you've probably heard about the Appalachian Mountains is its intense biodiversity and tons of different plants, animals, trees, salamanders, you name it. But one thing you probably haven't heard of is something called microclimates. And I mentioned it earlier along this hike, but a microclimate is 
basically it it is ecosystems that don't necessarily belong in a certain geographical area they're restricted to this geographical area and are formed by change in elevation and also historical um historical settling of that ecosystem so for example we are seeing our first entrance into one of the microclimates in the Appalachian region. This microclimate in particular is called the spruce fir forest. Um, we aren't actually there yet, but we are currently in the northern hardwood forest, characterized by maples and birch trees. But now we're starting to see some balsam firs leading into um, the spruce fir forest. So as we hike, slowly more of these hardwood deciduous trees will start. Welcome to the Spruce Fir Forest. We're about three, three miles, three and a half miles from Hughes Gap, where we started. And when I met back with you guys before, uh, we only saw one fir tree, and now it is all over us. And so, with microclimates, like I said, as you climb in elevation, the ecosystems begin to change equivalent to you climbing in latitude on Earth. So we are practically walking into northern Canadian forests, but we're still in North Carolina. Because of this, microclimates, they're only, or at least the spruce fir forest microclimate, is only on top, on the highest peaks of mountains in the Appalachian region. And with climate change increasingly getting worse, the, the lower elevation ecosystems, or the, the mountains down there, are rising in heat. And that is causing these ecosystems, these, these lower elevation ecosystems, to push into the spruce fir forest and encroach in on them and make them smaller. This makes not only the ecosystem itself endangered and in need of protection, but also the species that live inside of it. We're going to continue on. The forest is only going to get thicker from here. Let's go. Now that we're entering the spruce fir forest, we might find some different species we wouldn't find in different ecosystems. Here is one very unique species that you may find in this area, the Appalachian fir club moss. Endemic to the highest alpine areas of the Appalachian Mountains, you won't find this moss anywhere else in the world. This moss is also different from your average moss. Club mosses are more like ferns and conifers. They have hair-like roots, which mosses don't have, and vascular tissue. You can tell the age of the moss kind of like the age of a tree. Just count the rings of vegetation forming up the stalk. Each ring represents one spring's worth of growth. Wood sorrel is an herbaceous plant. The leaves and flowers on this herb are edible, resembling a sour, tangy taste. The bittergill mushroom is an infrequent species and grows in association with conifer trees. These are inedible due to the flesh being bitter and very hot. The world aster is characterized by its upper leaves growing so close together they appear world. This aster is threatened in Kentucky and presumed extirpated in Ohio. The tree lungwort lichen gets its name from its historical use for lung ailments such as asthma and tuberculosis. It is a major indicator for a healthy forest often found in old growth forests and is an excellent air quality indicator. Old Man of the Woods is edible when young, but as it ages, it becomes crusty, wimpy, and tasteless. It can only be distinguished by a similar species, confusing Old Man of the Woods with an electron microscope. With around 100 species in its genus, only 10 species of hair cap moss are found in North America. Each capsule resembles a grain of wheat containing the spores for the moss. There are some other species you may find in this area that deserve mentioning. Look up in the trees to spot the endangered Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel and the Red Squirrel. Listen for the tiny toots of the Northern Sawit Owl. And you might need a hand lens for the smallest tarantula in the world, the Spruce Fir Moss Spider. The second leg of our hike will take us to the precious Mountain Balds, where we will have a chance to experience one of the most unique ecosystems in the world. You can hike just this section as an in and out by starting at Cloudland, crossing Carver's Gap, and all the way to Grassy Ridge. 
You can cut this in half by parking at Carver's Gap. However, we advise against this due to overcrowding. All right, so we've made it to an iconic shelter along the AT. We are currently at Roan High Knob, which is the highest point um, in Tennessee, and this is the highest shelter along the Appalachian Trail. Uh, just in the heart of the one of the rarest ecosystems along the Appalachian Trail, the spruce fir forest. Uh, many through hikers and uh, weekend hikers alike come here to stay and inside the shelter and beat out the cold weather. So from here, we're gonna hike, we're gonna continue east. We're gonna hike all the way down to Carver's Gap um, and then go through there and up onto the Mountain Balls. About 6.6 .6 miles into our hike, we have made it to Carver's Gap. Uh, Carver's Gap is probably the most popular and overcrowded place uh, along the Appalachian Trail. Um, I recommend, uh, if you are choosing to come to this point, to please use the shuttle system. Do not drive up here. And in general, I recommend picking a different place to start and maybe coming to Carver's Gap and maybe having someone pick you up from there, if you'd like. Um, but uh, other than that, we'll be heading up towards the Mountain Balls now, um, and we'll be experiencing a whole new ecosystem, rare and only endemic to the Appalachian region. In fact, this region is so rare and fragile that it's become a major focus in conservation for SAHC. After this hike, I talked to a former SAHC board advisor and past president, Jay Lutzi, who elaborated on the threat of overcrowding and how we can help it. To me, one of the answers to overcrowding in special places is protecting more special places and dispersing traffic. So, um, you know, I've been to Mount Washington. Mount Washington is crowded. If you drive up Mount Washington, one part of it is very crowded. Just like in the Rhone Highlands, one part of it is very crowded. The rest is not crowded. That doesn't mean in the future it might not become so crowded that you'll have an impaired experience there. So it definitely bears monitoring and it bears creating new communication tools and educating people about how to leave no trace and how to camp responsibly, how to create parking lots that don't overflow and how to steer people to other great outdoor opportunities so that we lessen the impact in um, the few places that are becoming magnets. And I think what we deal with on the balds in the Southern Appalachian in particular is it's not just that they're beautiful, it's that they're extremely fragile and that the very grass tufts, that is a, that is a globally imperiled forest community type, that grass bald. Um, in the Southern Appalachians. It is composed of Arctic relic species that don't exist with that genetic makeup anywhere else on earth. And so it's not just, well, I don't like trails that are muddy. Um, the problem is I don't like trails that kill rare plants. So we have a really high duty in the Rhone uh, to get it right, not just to not spoil the experience and the scenery for, for other users, but also because we have, as part of our mission, our land trust mission and working with our partners is protecting a fragile habitat type and the rare species that, that can only withstand so much foot traffic. Lady Fern can reach up to five feet in height. Additionally, Lady Fern is native to the entire continental US and Alaska. Okay. The scientific name for sneezeweed, Helenium, 
originates from Greek mythology and widespread belief that common sneeze weeds started to grow from the ground that was soaked with the tears from Helen of Troy. Dark-eyed juncos form monogamous pairs that mate for a lifetime and produce two to three broods per season. All right, seven miles into our hike. I hope you all are, are hanging in there. <laughs> uh, we just made it past Round Bald and Jane Bald behind us. And uh, so we're about roughly 5,800 feet. And we are in our second major ecosystem along this hike, also known as the rare mountain balds. This section of the hike is absolutely beautiful. You can start at Carver's Gap or where we're gonna be ending on day one, you can start at the over mountain shelter and come back this way. As you can see, we are also inside of a cloud. Normally, this view would be absolutely beautiful, 360 degrees seeing into Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, but every now and then, periodically, the Rhone has a massive cloud system that moves through the mountaintops. And that's what we're experiencing right now, but it's, really beautiful in and of itself. Uh, so maybe, hopefully, when you come up, you'll get to experience some better views. The third leg of our hike will take us down from the mountain balds and back into the northern hardwood forest. Here, you can experience natural optical illusions, such as parallax. You can hike just this section as an in and out by starting at the Overmountain Victory Trail entrance from Roaring Creek Road. The fourth and final leg of our hike will take us down deeper into warmer forests to the rich Cove Forest and Tennessee State Natural Area of Hampton Creek Cove. You can hike just this section as an in and out by starting at the Over Mountain Victory Trail entrance from Roaring Creek Road or from the Hampton Creek Cove entrance in Tennessee. The final leg of our hike brings us to Hampton Creek Cove State Natural Area. This 693 acre state natural area is a prime jewel of conservation in the mountains of Tennessee. Here, SAC helps manage this land and protects over 60 plus species of birds, brook trout and over thousands of feet of stream, and tons of trees and plants living in northern hardwood forests. In fact, the entire time as you hike here, you will be hiking along this stream and witnessing pristine mountain streams that have been protected for decades by SAHC. Since 1986, Hampton Creek Cove has been co-managed by the state of Tennessee and SAHC. Thousands of linear feet of stream provide one of the healthiest populations of native brook trout while also being crucial headwaters for the local watershed. Additionally, Hampton Creek Cove is one of the largest breeding grounds for the golden wing warbler in the southern Appalachians, making this a prime area for conservation. Historically, this property has been used for agricultural use, with our caretaker for the cove, who grazes cattle and horses on roughly 100 acres of open pasture land, plus our riparian restoration activities. Hampton Creek Cove is an excellent example of natural area preservation while continuing agricultural practices. While hiking through Hampton Creek Cove, you will also arrive in our fourth ecosystem in the Rhone Highlands, the Cove Forest. Here, you will find an array of biodiverse trees, plants, and animals. This includes tulip poplars and beech trees, box turtles and bears, even bobcats, and also the golden wing warbler. Also known as the Green Elf Cup, these tiny fungi eventually paint the area of which they grow on green. This pigment in wood has historically been sought after by woodworkers. Moths are attracted to light because of their internal navigation system. They use the light of the moon to help travel, but bright lights such as a lamp confuse them, acting as a super stimulant and trapping them until death. Rock tripe is an edible lichen. Historically, George Washington used this lichen to feed his troops during Valley Forge. Make sure to follow USDA guidelines on collecting wild edibles and research about what species you are gathering. 
Never gather lichens that are still attached to their substrate, but only those that have fallen off of a tree or rock. Uh, now, if you're thinking this is tiring, hiking almost 14 miles, historically, think about all the men that hiked through here almost 200 years ago. In fact, they were called the Over Mountain Men. In 1780, during the Revolutionary War, these men hiked over 330 miles through four separate states to the Battle of Kings Mountain, where they would win a decisive victory in the Revolutionary War. So as you hike down this road, think about the thousands of feet that have laid their tracks into this trail and all the memories that you're passing by. Nearing the end of your hike, don't be alarmed, but our caretaker here maintains cattle and horses and grazes them over about a hundred acres. Uh, so coming through here, you'll pass through at least four gates. Make sure you close all of them behind you if they were closed before encountering them. And don't bother the cows and they won't bother you. And you can make your way to the end of the trail. Alright, congratulations! If you've been with us since Hughes Gap, you have completed an over a 14 mile hike through the entire Roan Highlands, all the way down the Overmountain Victory Trail, and ended here at the end of the Hampton Creek Cove State Natural Area in Tennessee. Uh, you can also start from here if you'd like, do it reverse, go through Hampton Creek Cove and all the way through back to Hughes Gap, or you can cut it up to sections. You could just do this part up to the Overmountain Crossroads where the intersects with the AT and come back down, or any of the other maps that we have shared throughout this hike. Um, I'll have links below in the video for each individual trail with a custom map that you can follow and our entire 14 mile trip. So thanks for watching, I hope you guys learned something and stay curious.